Rhonda Held and Rob Nichols, who are going to talk about keeping the focus on valued social roles, the keys to the community belonging. Rhonda has managed services and held government positions. She is now an independent consultant and is a member of the PLA Management Committee. Rob has worked in the community services since 1976. He has supported a wide range of people. Rob is now the coordinator of Luke 14 Network of the CBM Australia. Good morning, it's great to be here. I was thinking um, over those years, I've probably been to, I don't know how many conferences as you can imagine. But the truth is, uh, there's only three I've ever enjoyed. And uh, one of those is this conference, the One Person at a Time conference. It's, it's uh, in its various times that I've been able to uh, be part of it. So it's a great pleasure to be part of this. The theme of this conference is keeping the focus on valued lives one person at a time. It's our task to set the scene by contemplating the question, what are the key ingredients for valued lives? A, um, a few years ago, a number of you might have met Clint Doyle and his mother Trish. They spoke at the One Person at a Time conference about five years ago. At that time, Clint had a start of the floristry business in Perth, which had been a dream of his and his family for many years. Clint had demonstrated a talent for colour and a knowledge of flowers at an early age and had persisted with that dream with the support of his parents through a great deal of discouragement. His continuing battle with a heart condition that had hospitalised him on many occasions, I practised that word last night, and had, had caused a good degree of disability, threatened to exclude him from his dreams. There was also pressure from many to settle for a life in disability support programs. Clint says this about that time. It's been an interesting couple of decades with plenty of ups and downs, but because my family focuses on my ability rather than my disability, I'm able to paint, arrange beautiful flowers and share my passion with the world. For the past couple of years, Clint and his family have lived in Kona in Hawaii, where he has gained a reputation as an artist. He has developed a mentoring relationship with a Hawaiian internationally known artist, Wyland, and has had his own exhibition at the Wyland Gallery, Gallery in Kona. In this picture, we see Clint and his family at the opening night of his exhibition, where he sold three of his paintings at a total value of $11,000. He has established himself as an artist with his art, his sales, his recognition publicly, and his relationships within the arts community. He has also continued with his floristry business while his younger brother, Kent, who has the same condition, has now established his own catering business. You can read and so see more about Clint at his website, which is simply clintdoyle.com. Clint's story is a powerful illustration of the impact that valued roles can have in the life of a person with a disability. In this paper, we want to unpack for you why and how that happens. So as we said, the conference theme is keeping the focus on valued lives, one person at a time. And our task here is to try and define what we mean by a valued life. Now some people may say it's not possible to define a valued life without making value judgments. However, there are some elements that most people could agree on make for a good life. In fact, there's been research done in Australia that finds there's a high degree of agreement about the factors that contribute to a stable state of well-being, feeling satisfied, feeling contented. And the research distinguishes between well-being and happiness. Sometimes happiness is a bit transitory. And as Deb said earlier, um, there can be lots of struggles, but sometimes those struggles lead to well-being. So the factors um, that they include are health, um, personal relationships, how safe you feel, your standard of living, what you're achieving in life, feeling part of the community and your future security. Dr. Wolfensberger, uh, the founder of this, the theory of social role valorisation, listed at least 17 things that would be generally considered by most people to be the good things in life. And they included family or a small intimate group, a place to call home, 
belonging to a community or uh, communities might be local communities or communities of interest, having friends, having a belief system or a spiritual framework, having meaningful work or contribution, the absence of threats, feeling safe and secure, having opportunities and expectations that you will discover and develop your skills, your abilities, your gifts and your talents, to be viewed as human and to be treated with respect, to be dealt with honestly, not to be a victim of gross injustice, to be treated as an individual and to have a say in the important decisions that affect your life. Access to the important places of everyday life, so not being physically excluded from the community. Access to ordinary social activities of life. Being able to contribute and to have your contributions recognised as valuable and to have good health. Now, can you disagree with anything on that list? Is that what you would agree is a good life? It's really important to note that these are factors that are common across many societies and groups and aren't necessarily specific to a particular culture or socioeconomic status, to particular generations or even to geographic areas. While the order of importance of these factors might vary depending on our situation, they really are common elements that most people would agree make for a valued life. Uh, in some research on recovery for people with a mental illness, the authors conclude that growth, meaning and connectedness are important contributors to a good life and are actually shown to speed recovery and, and create good health. Now, we understand that that's not just true for people with mental illness, but universally important to all of us. So what are valued roles? You'll notice that we will come back to... Uh, to have some self-reference here. So I'd like to think you to think about yourselves as we talk about some of these things. What makes our lives worth living? Why do we get out of bed in the morning? We had to get up at 5 a.m. this morning to be here to set up. I don't know why I got out of bed this morning. <laughs> we have responsibilities. We have things we enjoy doing. We have things that we need to do to survive day to day, such as work or shopping. Some of us feel that we have too much to do. Others, perhaps not enough to do. We would propose that valued roles help make for valued lives and we want to explain to you how that comes about. I want to acknowledge here the work of Dr Wolfensberger on social role valorisation theory and pay tribute to his life which sadly ended earlier this year. Valued roles come in many forms. They're relationship roles. For example, a family member, all of us have, uh, we're, we're a son, daughter, mother, father, brother, sister. Uh, we have neighbours, or we are neighbours. We have work, work roles such as being a colleague or a supervisor or receptionist. We have community roles, being a member of a club, being a sporting team member, or being a member of a community choir, for example. We have leisure and interest roles, being a member of a gym, being a member of a golf club, and maybe even playing golf. Uh, in the picture we see here, a friend of ours, uh, Jason, uh, is enjoying a popular Central Coast pastime. He lives in Gosford on the New South Wales Central Coast, where a lot of sailing goes on. And uh, he's enjoying the, the, uh, something that's very important to him, sailing. And uh, in doing that, he enjoys a greater mobility than he normally has, where he has some difficulty with his mobility out on the water. It's very smooth. Other roles include such things as cultural roles, being an elder, or being a church member. Other things are citizen roles, citizenship roles, voting, being a local council member, being part of a neighbourhood action group, or household roles such as being a homeowner, a tenant, a gardener, or a cook. So what do roles bring? Through this process of socialisation, we accumulate and embrace a range of roles in our lives. Just think for yourself, how many roles do you have in your life? thinking about that list. Those roles are important to us as a sign of belonging and they contribute to things in our lives such as a sense of status and identity, where we belong, with whom we belong, autonomy and freedom, personal growth and development, the opportunity to contribute in some way and to how we see ourselves and how others see us. So it is through those roles we gain access to the good things in life 
which we outlined above. So uh, this photo of a group of cyclists is a great example of what roles bring. To be a cyclist, you need to look the part, so you need the lycra. You need to act the part. You need to be able to stay on a bike. Um, but what cycling can bring to someone like Jordan, who has cerebral palsy, are many of the benefits that Rob just mentioned. There's fitness, there's personal growth, setting goals for training. In this particular ride, it was getting over the Westgate Bridge and uh, setting a speed record coming down the other side. Um, there's belonging with the group. You, you notice that cyclists are always in a bunch. Um, and, you know, belonging is very important. And here also Jordan was contributing because it was a fundraising ride, so he was raising money. Of course, most cyclists are in it for the role reward of coffee and cakes at the end of the ride. On the other side of some of these things, a, uh, a recent report prepared by the National League People with uh, Disabilities and Carer Council outlines many examples of people with disabilities being placed in negative roles in our community. There's a number of quotes in that report uh, from people with disabilities I'd like to just uh, give to you. There are still widespread misconceptions and stereotypes about people with disability. These include that they are a danger, a burden and a threat. It is not uncommon to hear people express the view that people with a disability would be better off in institutions with people of their own kind. Another quote, we desire a place within the community. This place is not just somewhere to lay down our heads, but a place which brings comfort and support with daily living, friendship, meaningful work, exciting recreation, spiritual renewal, relationships in which we can be ourselves freely with others, and out of this great things may flourish. Another quote. Perhaps a time will come when we no longer have to protect ourselves from loss and can feel that this place is the place of creation, of recreation, co-creation. Perhaps then our loneliness will fade. Perhaps then we will belong in our gifts, perhaps meagre, perhaps spectacular, freely shared. And from, from there will flow all the delights and tragedies of a life lived in the community, shaped not by exclusion and oppression, but by everyday ordinaries whatever that might be. So in the final part of this talk, we're going to talk about practical strategies that we can implement to assist people to have valued roles in our community in order to, take to have those advantages that we spoke about. But first, we just want to outline some aspects of roles that are important to understand when we're implementing those strategies. So one of these is that all roles exist in relation to other roles. For example, a mother can only be a mother if someone is in the role of child. To be an employee, we must have an employer. To be a sports coach, we need a sports team. And to be a good team, you need a good coach. So if we're going to assist people to have valued roles, we need to ensure we have the people willing to take on those complementary roles. So we need customers willing to purchase the goods or services from the business person. We need teachers willing to teach the students. And we need employers such as Coles shown in this slide who are willing to give people a job. Um, this is a picture of when Coles won the Employer of the Year Award for people with disabilities. It's also important to understand that this complementarity requires some agreement between those involved. For example, if a woman with a disability has a child, those around her, including her child, may not respect her, the role she has as a mother um, if she's perceived as lacking the skills expected of a parent. And in that case, she may start to lose belief in herself and her role as a mother as well. So to be embedded in this role, she needs to be able to learn the skills of good motherhood, to be given the opportunities to practice the role, to have good role models, to have positive expectations that she can fulfil the role and positive reinforcement when she's doing a good job. Some roles also have a much greater influence on our lives than others. Um, and that's often because the amount of time they take up or the importance of the role. So being a partner or a parent um, has major responsibilities attached to it. It takes up much of our time. It's not a role we can easily give up. Um, again, our work roles have a major influence in our lives. Again, we spend a lot of time at work. We have lots of responsibility. 
Uh, we earn our incomes from work. Um, and we also get lots of opportunities, such as maybe the opportunity to travel or uh, training and career development. In, in contrast, there are some roles that have a fairly minor influence on our lives, such as being a moviegoer or a second cousin twice removed. So people can be engaged in roles too at varying levels of depth. A person who's deeply entrenched in a role is comfortable with the associated behaviours and what it involves and takes on the responsibilities of that role. They not only look the part, but they act the part. This often occurs over time, we get embedded in our roles over time, but time does not necessarily create that. Um, so we need to have consistent expectations um, by a range of influential people that we can perform that role and a high degree of congruity between the person and the role. For example, Clint, who Rob spoke of earlier, um, has great role depth in his role as an artist because of his long-term love of colours, his relationship with other artists, his ability to set, sell his art, and the consistent views by all of those around him, his family and friends, that he is an artist. If everyone wanted to him to be an artist and spoke of him as an artist, but he lacked the skills or the interest, then there wouldn't be role depth in that role. Um, whether people are valued or devalued in our community also has to do with human perceptions and people's evaluation of other people. We can't help ourselves. We do evaluate others. We often make judgments based on very um, little amounts of information. And those judgments are often um, affected both by our background and our experiences, by the norms and what's accepted in the society in which we live, and also by what we are actually seeing. Um, so if you've ever jumped on a bus and looked at the variety of people sitting on the bus, you might make choices unconsciously about who you sit next to based on your evaluation of those people. So devaluation in our community can often result from how people with disabilities are perceived by others. <coughs> However, valued roles can be even more powerful than a person's disability in shaping the attitudes of other people. And the following example illustrates this point. Many of you may know Stephen Hawking, um, who knew by the time he was eight years old that he wanted to be a scientist and chose physics. He was interested in studying the universe. He attended Oxford University and received a PhD from Cambridge. By the time he was 35 years old, Stephen Hawking um, was Cambridge's first gravitational physics professor. He also published a book called A Brief History of Time, From the Big Bang to Black Holes. But when Stephen was 21 years old, he was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. This disease attacks the nerves that control the body's voluntary movements. It affects walking, speaking, breathing, swallowing. At the time of his diagnosis, the doctors gave Hawking two years to live. He's defied this time frame and he's still working. Today, Stephen can't move much at all. He has trouble holding his head up. He cannot speak, although this doesn't stop him. He now uses a special computer that displays the text he types and speaks what he types with an electronic voice, and you may have heard him speaking. So you can see from this example, his role as a scientist overrides his disability, and as you can see from the photo, opens up all sorts of opportunities for him. Some people have severe limitations on their ability to actually perform roles um, because of perhaps their physical limitations, their inability to communicate verbally, or perhaps cognitive impairments. But roles are not just about doing, they're also about being. You can be a brother or an auntie regardless of what you're able to do in that role. For older people, um, they've often had many roles they can no longer perform but it may be possible to have role cues that remind people of the roles they've held. The lawyer surrounded by his legal books, a champion bowler with his or her trophies, um, the bush worker with photos of their walks, or a gardener surrounded by their prized plants and flowers. I want to spend a bit of time just talking about some areas of strategy. The first is about preventing the loss of roles. Uh, we see here again Clint at the opening of his uh, art. Uh, Clint's Role's been threatened on more than one occasion through extended times in hospital. So he's had to spend time in hospital through his heart stopping again and going through uh, all manner of surgery and those sorts of things. And each time 
Many people say, Clint, stop doing all you're doing. You're wearing yourself out. This is bad for your heart. But uh, his response is that I would lose my life if I stopped what I was doing. And so preventing the loss of roles is critical. We have to identify the existing valued roles that people have and ensure that these roles are not taken away. This can sometimes be unwittingly done by the human service system. For example, when people are separated from their families or communities and lose the roles associated with that. Young children are at risk of losing the role of a student when they are unable to access the mainstream education system and at risk of becoming a special student with different expectations and privileges associated with that role. The following personal account by Craig Wallace of Life in a Special School illustrates this point. One of the schools I attended was in the, within the grounds, uh, sorry, one of the schools I attended for people with physical disability stands head and shoulders above the rest in terms of sheer weirdness. Located within the grounds of a hospital, this activity school was a relic of another time. There was no maths, no English, no ge geography, no science, no career education. Instead, our days consisted of a bizarre daytime, daytime curriculum, including spending whole days potting and planting in a nursery, which on sold to the public, visual arts with a strong focus on making clay pots, which went back to the nursery, and a range of drama workshops. At least those were fun. What all the special schools I attended had in common was that they were sad places with low standards, low outcomes and low expectations. They were warehouses for staff exiled from mainstream system with some treasured exceptions, poorly funded, poorly supervised and produced rotten academic outcomes for those of us unfortunate enough to be stuck in them. The second step is about preserving existing roles. Where people already have valued roles, these need to be preserved and enhanced. For example, a young woman with a disability was the oldest sister in a family with a number of quite young children in the family. This role was able to be enhanced by teaching her to cook so that she could assist her, assist her mother around the house in a way that would be generally expected of a young adult in that situation, a big sister. So her role of sister and daughter was strengthened by a contribute to the house, contribution to the household. Mother of a young man who acquired a head injury while travelling overseas was very aware of the importance of this. Immediately her son returned to Melbourne to a high care ward in a hospital. She arranged for all of his friends to visit. She kept contact with them and although some fell away was able to keep a strong network of friends with her son as he gradually regained consciousness of his world. His sense of being a young man with friends of his own age was a critical part of his rehabilitation. The third part is finding new roles. For people who have not had the opportunity to develop many valued roles, then we need to search for new roles that reflect the person's strengths and interest. We'll talk in a moment about planning processes that can help you to think about possibilities for helping people to find valued roles. We're reminded by Rick Thompson of the unlimited resources in our community that can enable us to match the strengths and interests of a person with a disability and the assets in our local community. He advocates thinking about the power of 10. Look at the many clubs, organisations, churches, community groups and businesses in your area. In each of these settings, be challenged to think of at least 10 roles that someone could take on as part of that group. This will lead to potentially thousands, if not millions, of opportunities for new roles. Scott Ramsey outlines a valuable approach called roles-based planning which provides a systematic approach to what valued roles may be possible for people. His framework is useful and leads us to consider the following questions. Think of these again for yourselves. What are your, what's your history? What are your interests? When do you see most alive and engaged? What's a good day like for you or for the person? What are your interests and passions? What are their interests and passions? What do most people appreciate about you? What do most people appreciate about the person? What are, the, what are your interests and passions? Uh, sorry, what are your skills? What are the possible valued roles for this person? And we work through things like relationship roles, work roles, education, community. Where would you begin? What's the most important role to begin? And what will have the most profound impact on the life of that person? What will meet the most pressing need? What will open up the most opportunities? 
Where does this happen? Who, who should be involved in this? What activities will be part of that role and what language is associated with it? What skills and competencies are necessary for that person to be able to perform the role? And the action plan that follows is to work out uh, what supports will that person need in order to take on the, that role. It's important for people who may not have had many valued roles to have more than one role as a protection against the potential loss of roles. However, that doesn't mean doesn't need to happen all at once. Some roles will naturally develop as a result of other roles. For example, work roles often leads to work friendships. Most people have a balance of roles, such as work or contribution roles, community group member, friend, sports person. It's important that not all roles fall into one category, for example, leisure roles. Some writers have talked about the power of uh, uh, volunteering as, as gaining access to valued social roles in the community. Voluntary activities can foster a social environment where people with disabilities can be seen as credibly, credible coping individuals. Certainly voluntary roles are valued social roles for those who also, of us who also have work roles. But an imbalance occurs if all roles are voluntary and not none, none paid. Many roles also have developmental stages such as the career planning and learning and development opportunities typically available in a work role. In education, similarly. Role theory aligns closely with the idea of positive psychology and strengths-based practice. A number of shared concepts between these fields include the idea that human beings reach their potential when we consciously create environments that facilitate strengthening existing talents and, and uh, attributes, build positive emotions that lead to positive actions, and accept the power of positive imagery on the human psyche to affect the changes we want in our lives. An understanding of the importance of roles is essentially in true um, strength-based practice. It will mean not just an emphasis on the strengths of the person, but what roles those strengths can lead to. An understanding of valued roles can open the possibilities of opportunities for relationships and participation in valued activities. How many roles is enough? As already mentioned, the importance of roles in terms of socialisation and belonging cannot be underestimated. One dynamic that has proved beneficial is the multiplying effect of roles, one role leading to one another. It is tempting as we embark on strategies to assist people gain positive roles to relax once one or two roles have been achieved. However, as we've already said, that multiplying is very important for uh, safety for the person because maybe one role could disappear. A few depthful roles may be better than many shallow roles, of course. How does role expansion occur for people who have been denied roles? The key is to understand that there are some roles that enable role expansion. Work roles are one such role as further opportunities for skills and knowledge become available in the workplace. Studies have found that multiple roles are beneficial to people's health. In fact, they've said that having multiple social roles increases individual well-being the results therefore support the role expansion theory. It's now um, my pleasure to introduce you to Pat Frantangelo. Um, Pat is presenting tomorrow, but we wanted to make sure you, we, that you knew who Pat is um, so you can have opportunities to catch up with her during the day. Um, Pat is the director of Onondonga Community Living and is going to tell you tomorrow the story of the transformation of her agency um, and people's lives one at a time. Um, but at this point, Pat's just going to tell you a story of one person, um, Colin, and uh, the, the roles that Colin has been able to uh, take on. Thank you, Pat. All right, um, I'm short, so I'm gonna put these down, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, first of all, our agency does all one-to-one -one service. It's, um, what I try to do is just pick one person, and I'm going to try and do this quickly. It usually takes me about an hour to three hours to tell a story about a person. So, But anyhow, Colin, how I got to know him, his, his mother was on our board of directors, and Colin was living at home with mom and dad, and mom and dad are teachers in the community, very well connected in their home community. The town of Manly is very well connected in their church. Um, love their son to pieces. Um, through 
the life with them, Colin knew a lot of neighbors. He was involved with the local church. Um, he plays drums. And he was involved with the band at the local church. Um, he um, did a, a camp as a child and eventually became um, a helper at the camp as a young adult. He um, had jobs locally through the school, and as he was transitioning from school to um, adult life, the, the family began to look at you know, services. And one of the things that was striking is that they had a person that was a friend of Collins that was willing to be his support person. They go to an organization to see if they could get help with helping him to volunteer. Um, somewhere, and that organization said, no, we cannot hire fa family friends. The, the um, mother came back, and you could see the look on her face, and um, I said, well, what? there's no rule against that. Um, we're a small agency. We don't want to get bigger, um, but yet we have bleeding hearts for people when they're in trouble. And so um, at that point, we said to mom, you know, we can do whatever, you know, so we ended up hiring the person that the family wanted, and Colin began volunteering at um, uh, a senior center, I believe it was, when um, we first started supporting him. Okay, as he begins transitioning out of high school, though, um, adult services, people are beginning to think about, you know, what's, what's going to happen. And the logical thing for Colin, he's watching all of his... Um, senior companions, um, they're going off to college, and his idea was to go to college. So it didn't seem, you know, any reason why we couldn't do that. So Colin went off to college the same time as all the seniors of his uh, school did. And so he goes to Syracuse University. He gets some support through our agency. Um, he takes classes. Um, first of all, he registers with cl for classes just like any other student does. Um, he takes classes with other typical um, students. There's no special anything about it. Um, he works at um, one of the, the uh, uh, university stages. Um, he volunteers there. He likes to pass out the, the, the evening brochures for the different plays and that sort of thing. He loves to work out. Um, he goes and works out at the local um, uh, uh, what do you call them, you know, physical ed places along the campus. He's a regular at the pizza shop. People know him very well. He studies with study groups, and um, he is a, he's a student in every um, piece of the word. Um, he also, with, you know, he goes to college um, during the school year. In the summertime, he's not going to college. So they were thinking about what kind of um, things can he do during, you know, during his day or whatever. So he is working at restaurants. Um, he still volunteers at the um, senior center. Um, he still plays his jump, drums. He's still part of his church. He's still got all those neighborhood connections. He, as he began to think about life, and the parents started thinking about life, the, not, the natural thing is for him to be moving. You know, and that's a lot of what happens when people are in their early 20s. So, we came together, and Colin, it sounds like he's a simple, easy guy, but it takes him a long time to transition to different things. And trying to think about moving out of mom and dad's house was, was a hard thing. Although he wanted it, he didn't know how to get it, you know, those sorts of things. So um, we spent probably a year, you know, just talking together. And sometimes this circle meeting would be 20 people, people from the church, people from the neighborhood, family. And sometimes it would be mom, dad, and Colin, you know, just depended on what was going on. Um, but um, just before I left, um, you know, what happened was that uh, Colin originally thought he might move up into the Syracuse University section, but he got very nervous about that, very nervous. And so when we started to sort out what that all meant, you know, the home community is what made sense for him. Um, because he had his church there, he had his neighborhoods there, all of those sorts of things. So when that decision was made, it made sense for the family to really look for the home for for Colin, with Colin, instead of our organization. They know the neighborhood, they know the community. So, so they ended up, um, it was a long, you know, uh, 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 travel for them trying to figure out exactly what home would work um, for a couple of different reasons. Colin's used to living in the country. Um, Colin's used to having quiet, but also Colin's used to making a lot of noise because he has drums. You know, so um, they, they finally come up with a, a single family home 
in the uh, Manlius area where they live. Um, it's down closer to the city. It's on a bus route, so he can potentially learn how to get back and forth places. And um, it was last Friday, um, the two days before I left, he eventually moved to that place. Um, so he's in the local community. Um, it was a really nice meeting that we had the week before I left. Um, we sat around Colin's living room with his mom and dad um, at their house, and they were discussing, you know, what kinds of things were, were, would come from mom's and dad's house, what kinds of things would Colin buy, what kinds of things would mom and dad buy, what kinds of things did our contract need to buy. So it was a combination of a lot of different things. Mom and dad helped to do the move. We didn't do the move. Um, mom and dad helped to set up the house. Um, uh, Colin also is not able to, he's able to be alone a little bit, but uh, mom and dad did not feel comfortable with him living independently. So what we did is we advertised for a, just a guy to live with him. And um, the uh, person that Colin's chosen is also a musician. He plays a guitar. So the two of them moved in together um, last week. Um, also at that meeting, he brought out his uh, high school yearbook and he's showing me a picture of somebody. And it was somebody that he's chosen to um, help him at his house. So we'll be hired, we have hired that person. So what we've tried to do is uh, maintain the roles that he's had in the past because he was, you know, he's a family member, he's a neighbor, he's a church member, he's a band person, he's a lot of different things. He still had those roles. We tried to expand his roles as it made sense for him as he moved into his adult life. So now he's a college student, um, he's a volunteer, he's a, he works out, he, you know, pay, gets paid work, he gets a lot of different things. And now he's into a, another role in his life, which is now he's a, he's a renter, um, you know, he's uh, an adult moving up away from mom and dad's house. So that's just a little bit about one person in terms of how we try to, um, how we try to maintain the roles that people have and how we try to expand those as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. That is a great example of what Rob called earlier, role expansion theory, that how somebody can really blossom from having many, many roles in the community. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about um, the crit cr criticisms of role theory. Um, and there are some, do you believe? Uh, but critics would say that um, people have a right to be accepted as they are. Um, that disability is actually created by society and its lack of acceptance and inability to accommodate people of varying abilities. Critics would say that the focus on helping people to have valued roles is demanding change of the person, not of society. And this could be seen as an infringement of the rights and autonomy of the person. Critics say the approach means the status quo remains largely unchallenged. They contend that people with disabilities have been forced to conform and to fit in, while many in society are allowed to hold on to the unacceptable behaviours they have that exclude and reject people, that the hostility and the ridicule and paternalism. And similar criticisms, uh, criticisms apply to the term inclusion, uh, where they think that that means that people with disabilities must be weighted, must wait to be invited to be included in society. We would say that assisting people to have valued social roles is about social change, and it's not just about the change of the individual. And that's an area of human service practice that's been quite neglected. It's important to recognise that one of the strong themes of social role valorisation is that of autonomy and control. So when we assist people to have valued roles, that needs to occur in a way that supports people's autonomy and their choice. And as we said earlier, there are literally thousands or millions of roles available out there in the community. So a role never needs to be imposed upon a person. There are so many to choose from. And as we said, those roles need to, to fit with a person's interests and passions and strengths. I think the bigger issue is that we need to ch change societal values and attitudes so that people with disabilities are actually able to access the full range of socially valued roles that are available to them and are supported to maintain those roles. 
After all, everyone should be able to achieve those good things in life that valued roles bring. We just want to conclude by reinforcing the themes that we've covered in this presentation. Firstly, that in striving for a society which is open and equal, we understand that roles are the key for people to belong in community. This is particularly true for people who've been traditionally and consistently devalued by society. Secondly, that there are opportunities for people to have valued roles are many and varied. All people have strengths and gifts and we're only limited by our own creativity. Thirdly, that valued roles impact perceptions and societal change can be achieved through this process. And finally, that it is through valued roles that the things we all consider important for a valued life become available. That is the hope we have for all people. Thank you.